out of the way um, and that your spirit would communicate to your people, Lord. I just pray that you'd help us to have a good morning this morning. In your name we pray, amen. So, 1 John chapter 3, this will be our second lesson in 1 John chapter 3, and I want to review the last point that we talked about because if you'll remember, I was speaking at 200 miles an hour and we went two minutes over, and I don't feel like I did that point justice, and I really wanted to communicate that point clearly to you, so we will go through it um, at about half that speed, hopefully, this morning, um, though you have already heard, heard it, um, and I just wanted to get it to you because I felt like it was just so important. It was a unique, I felt like it was unique, at least a little bit, to give you something to think about. So I started, we'll jump in where I was talking about confirmation bias. So it's that thing that you don't realize how many other people drive a blue car until you buy a blue car, and then suddenly everybody in the world buys a blue car. And what I was talking about that in relation to was I was considering Cain and Abel, because John talked about don't hate your brother, and then he gave us the example of Cain and Abel. But as I was considering Cain and Abel, it occurred to me that the sin uh, that Abel had there was, was envy. He was envious of the praise or of the fact that God respected Abel's offering. Cain was envious of Abel. And I think that that's the, the, the big sin there that we see. Um, so in relation to that, I was reading and I saw these other verses that had the word envy in it and it caught my attention. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses one through four. I'll read them for you if you'd like me to. Even if you wouldn't like me to, I'll read them for you. <clears throat> and brethren, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are ye able now. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Did you see it there? Paul is rebuking them for being spiritually immature. And what John is talking about is the opposite side of that. John is talking about when it looks like what it looks like when you are saved, when you are spiritually immature. But here in these verses, Paul gives us a description of what someone who is spiritually immature looks like, of how someone who is spiritually immature acts. He says, if you're spiritually immature, you will stir up strife. And we've talked about strife uh, in the past. And strife is that idea of stirring up competition between people to make yourself look more spiritual than them. There is an important difference between stirring up competition to encourage people like we had a Sunday school competition. We were not stirring up strife between our Sunday school teachers. We were trying to encourage them to, do, to, 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 to enjoy what they have there as teachers. But... There is a stirring up of competition that makes people bitter and makes people argue with each other. What does strife cause? It causes divisions. Chew on this thought. God did not institute the idea of the church for himself. God does not need for there to be a church. He did it for us. He knew that none of us are strong enough to make it on our own. So he gave us the church. And he gave us gifts to use in the church for the edifying of each other. And I told you I really like that word edifying, right? The idea there, oike de mel, of building. We, we couldn't pronounce two Greek words, but we could pronounce this one, so I was super, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> though I couldn't pronounce two. But this one is oike de mel, which literally translated means to build a house. And the thing about building a house is, the idea connotated there with to build a house is not that the house doesn't exist and we're starting from scratch. It's an idea of adding to. There's already a house in existence. So when we come to church on Sunday morning, there's already a group of people here here, an ecclesia, a called out group of people here that we're adding to, that we're building up. So that's the idea there. Um, so in other words, uh, we're adding to something that already exists. So as you come to church, we're supposed to be adding to each other, but some cause division. Division is the opposite of building a house. It's tearing down the house. What do immature Christians do? They stir up fri strife. They stir up friction. They make people oppose each other. And it could be as simple as saying, you know, Marvin did a better job mowing the lawn than Alex did. And now Alex and Marvin are like competing with each other over who mows the lawn the best. Now, is the church going to get a better lawn mowed out of that? Sure. But what's going to happen is Alex and, and Marvin are not going to like each other anymore. And then Alex is going to sit over here and Marvin's going to sit over there. And we're going to have people on Alex's side and we're going to have people on Marvin's side. And who cares? It was all about selfishness and all about pride. But the person that stirs up strife is the person that goes to Alex and goes, hey, Alex, Marvin did a better job mowing the lawn than you. And then he walks over and he goes, hey, Marvin, Alex did a better job than you. And we know that people like that exist. 
We've seen that. <clears throat> the friction causes division. It causes people to take sides. And we talked about it before in that how when there is something wrong, you've been offended by somebody. The best thing you can do, the best thing, we talked about how love covers a multitude of sins. The best thing you can do is get on your knees before God and say, you know what, somebody did something and it hurt me and I was offended by it. I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna put that at the cross. I'm gonna leave that with you. But here's the thing. Sometimes we do that and we can't leave that there. We can't leave it there and we keep bringing it up and the devil keeps using that and making us bitter. And then the next thing that we need to do is go talk to that person and go, hey man, you gave me a weird look on Sunday. I've been thinking about it all week. What was that weird look about? And usually it's just a miscommunication. No, I wasn't even looking at you. I was looking at the piano. I was looking, I was just lost in space. I don't know why, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't know that I was, that, that, that came across that way. It's usually what happens. But unfortunately, there's something else that happens too. When you get offended, instead of <clears throat> getting on your knees before God and allowing love to cover that, instead of going to that person and talking to it, you go to everybody else and you talk to everybody else. And again, we have the church split. I talked about last time how it could be over something as simple as a cleaner. You know, somebody likes grease lightning and somebody else likes bleach. And, and now the grease lightning people are fighting with the bleach people. And now we've got people who want to use citrus oil. And we've got people that are just going at each other over what type of cleaner that we use. That's what spiritual immaturity looks like. That's what tearing each other apart instead of building each other up looks like. But here's the thing. When we looked at those verses, I said the word that caused me to get into these verses was the word envy. And, and the, the order that they were in, I think envy causes the other two. Envy causes strife. Envy causes divisions. I think it's fair to mention that envy and jealousy are not the same. Oftentimes in the English language, sometimes, again, we've talked about connotative definitions, so we just use words interchangeably that mean the same thing to us. But envy um, is wanting what someone else has. Jealousy is wanting someone to not take what you have. You're jealous over it. You think somebody's going to steal it from you. Envy is wanting what someone else has. Cain wanted the respect that Abel got for his offering. But I told you last Sunday, and I just want to say this again because I think it's so important. Cain didn't actually want God's praise. You say, well, he committed murder enough. What do you mean? He, he, he murdered his brother. What do you mean? He didn't really want it. Whether it was the type of herb, meat versus herb that was offered, whether it was the fact that he did not bring the first fruits, whether it was the fact that he gave it grudgingly, expecting a return, we don't know for sure. But here's the thing that we do know for sure, we know absolutely for sure, and we can stand on for sure, is that Cain knew what he was supposed to do. Cain knew what he was supposed to do in order for God to receive his offering, and Cain didn't want to do what God said. Cain knew what he was supposed to do, and Cain wanted God to, to, to take him the way that he was. Cain wanted God to receive his offering the way that he offered it, but that's not the God we serve. God says, if you're going to follow me, there are some rules. There's a way you're going to follow me. There's only one way to heaven. You're not going to get to heaven any other way but by that one way. Cain wanted to do it his own way. When we go back to the beginning where we started in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And we talked about that adoption and how many things that we have because we're his adopted sons. It says, Therefore the world knew us not because it knew him not. God is willing that you and I can be his children. And if we're his children, we talked about how it's so important that we act like his children but here's the thing, many people are willing to be adopted. They're willing to act like their dad. They're willing to love their brothers and sisters. They're willing to make every effort to live righteously, all things that John told us in the preceding verses that we should do. But what they're not willing to do is they're not willing for the world around them to not like them. They're not willing to not fit in. You see, John said, love not the world, and we talked about that. And we talked about how John wasn't giving you any specific thing in the world. John was being very open because he knows that each person under the sound of his writing, sound of writing, each person under the writing that he read, when they picked that up and it was read to the other people, which was the common practice then, each person who heard from John's letter, even to now, is going to have something different that is the thing that the devil uses, the philosophy of the world that the devil uses in their life. So John was being open, and he said, do not love the philosophy of the world. 
And one of the philosophies of the world that I think has permeated the church is the world's value system. The world's value system. So think about this, right? A Christian with a worldly value system looks at a church and assumes that the more people that are in that church, the more God is blessing. And we know that's not necessarily true. A Christian with a worldly value system looks at the church and assumes that God's not blessing it because, as they call it nowadays, they call it a campus. This is the church campus. Because God's not blessing it, it doesn't have a large campus. Or, oh, wow, God's not blessing that church. It only has one campus. A Christian with a worldly value system looks at the finances of the church and sees that they're struggling and says that God's not blessing them. Praise God that those are not God's standards. That's not what God says. God could be putting us through a test of faith and making us to struggle, and his hand could be right on us, and that's what he wants for us. God may not want us to have a large church at this point in time because he's got a plan of how he's going to guide and direct us. So when we superimpose those thoughts that the world has, oh, if God's blessing you, then you'll live in a mansion and have a Cadillac, that's just not the case. There are some preachers who it's very obvious when they walk into a room, God's hand is on them, and they came up in one of the ugliest looking hoopties you've ever seen in your life. But that's, I tell you, it really amazes me. If I can go on a rabbit trail for a millisecond here, some of the mission, the vehicles that missionaries drive, it shows the faith they have, brother. I've seen missionaries come in in like 400,000 mile cars with things falling off of them that I wouldn't trust to drive down to McDonald's, but God has gotten them through and that shows their level of faith that God, this is what God gave me. God will hold it together and sure enough, God does hold it together. It shows their value system is different than the value system of the world. And here's the thing. We don't want our church to fit into the world. The world rejected our dad. The world rejected Jesus. So if we're like him, the world will reject us. But when it rejects us, and here's what's so very important. What's so very important. We're to expect the rejection, but when it rejects us, when it says we're intolerant, when it says that we're old-fashioned, we're gonna act the same way that our dad did, the same way that Jesus did, the same way that God did. We'll show them that we're real. Real what? And turn to John 13, 35. We're going to show them that we're real disciples. We're going to show them that we have a true profession of faith. We're going to show them that we have a hope. And we talked about that word hope. It's not a maybe hope. It's not we hope God might come back. Maybe he won't. But we hope he will. It's God is coming back. It's a confident boasting in that fact. John 13, 35, it says this. How are people in the world going to know that we're his disciples? How are people in the world going to know that we're real? By this shall all men know. Well, how is that, John? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. How many people, and you and I can think of time and time again, well, we've witnessed to somebody, we've asked somebody to come to church, and they've said, I'm not going to that church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. I'm not going to that church. They're a bunch of backbiters. I'm not going to that church. Are we real Christians? Do we act like our dad? Do we practice righteousness, or do we practice sin? Do we love our brother and sister, or are we like Cain, who I'm sure, and this just, let this rattle through your head, right? Cain and Abel were brothers. Think about you growing up and how many times you said, I love you to your brother. I imagine that Cain told Abel that he loved them maybe every night, maybe when they woke up in the morning, maybe a few different times a day. Cain said that he loved his brother, but what happened? He envied his brother and he loved himself more than he loved his brother. And Jesus, in the Old Testament, talked to Cain. More than sending a prophet to talk to Cain, he talked to him directly. And he said, if you don't stop, sin lies at the door. He said, if you don't stop, this is going to escalate. But Cain did it his way. Cain wouldn't stop. Cain wouldn't repent. He escalated and he murdered the very brother that probably maybe even that morning, maybe the night before, he said, Abel, I love you. And he probably actually did. But because his envy overcame him, he murdered his brother. 1 John 3, verse 7, Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. This is one of the verses that we read earlier, and we focused on the verses around it, but this verse itself is so important. We also read the text about spiritual immaturity, that one of the divisions that they caused was by saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos. Listen to me. There's nothing wrong with following a man. And here's why. Because the apostle Paul said, you want to follow God? You want to be like Jesus? You want to know what it's like? Do what I do. 
do what I do. A very bold statement. But the Apostle Paul could make that statement because the Apostle Paul woke up in the morning and did everything he could do to be like Christ, to let Christ live through him. So when people followed Paul, they weren't actually following Paul. They were following Christ. The problem comes when you don't make sure that the person you're following is actually following Jesus. The problem comes when you follow a man over following God's word. The problem comes when you lift a man up to perfection. Pastor David and I both work very hard to study God's word and to teach you what God's word says. And what we mean by that is to teach you what God's word says, not what the Baptists say, not what some super cool theologian came out with last week. We want to teach you what the Bible actually says. But here's the thing. There are so many men who will get up and they'll stand behind a pulpit and they'll teach you what another man taught them. They'll teach you what they read in a book. They don't even consult God's word to find out if what they've read is true. We have got to make sure that we are following God's word to find out if those things are true. The question is, who are you following? And, you know, I can think of, as I was growing up, different men who, one, read a book. And because he read that book, he started following the man who wrote that book. And there was some doctrine in that book that was wrong. And unfortunately, that man started going in to wrong doctrine. And he went, he left our church, and he began following people that were not right. I can think of people who have listened to a sermon that they heard on the Internet. And there were a lot of good things in that sermon, but unfortunately, there was some bad doctrine in that sermon. But then they began to fall in love with that man. They began to lift that man up, and they left their church following a man who was not following Christ. It still goes back to you, though, who you are on the inside. Here's the thing, and we know this to be true. Darkness attracts darkness. People who seek to stir up strife stick together. People who are envious are often envious of the same people. You know, it's amazing. Titus is in there with the teens, but when I was leading the teens, you can find one bad teenager, and sure enough, they'll find another teenager. I shouldn't say bad teenager. You can find one teenager who's rebellious that's more effective. You can find one teenager who's rebellious, and sure enough, they'll find another rebellious teenager to hang out with. You can find one teenager who's on fire for God, and sure enough, they'll find another teenager who's on fire for God to hang out with. The same thing is true when we go to college, right? When you see people in college, if we were to walk around PCC campus, you see people wandering around in groups. Rarely do you see one person just wandering by themselves unless they're wandering to their group. You see people wandering around, and the groups that they hang out with are people who have the same attitude that they do. It would be utterly ridiculous for us to say, oh, that stops in college, right? Because adults do the same exact thing. We find people who are like us. We congregate with people who are like us. What I mean is, if you're seeking to practice sin, if you knowingly practice sin, then you'll look for a teacher who doesn't preach against that sin that is so precious to you. You'll want to believe the lie. Liars of a feather flock together. Remember how John ended his last chapter. He said they went out from us because they were not of us. They were looking for someone who was okay with their sin. They were looking for someone who did not care if they loved their brother or not. They were looking for someone who did not have any standards. But the same is also true. The converse of that statement is true. If you want to live righteously, if you want to have love for your brother, if you want to be purifying yourself, which we talked about and defined as getting in God's word and allowing God's word to be a mirror and show you what you look like and change you, then you'll find a friend You'll find a group of friends. You'll find a church. You'll find a preacher who preaches the truth. All of that was kind of review. I think some of that was a little bit new. So let's jump into John chapter 3, verse 15. John is going to continue with his theme of loving your brother, essentially. <clears throat> John three fifteen. he says this. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And we've talked about that so many times, right? About who are you actually willing to lay down your life for? And it's important when we look at that verse that we talk about for a second, and this isn't in my notes, but I wanted to talk about this anyhow. It's important when we look at that verse to realize that nobody took Jesus's life. They could not take his life. He laid it down willingly. And that's the idea there. And when we think of the martyrs that we've heard about, they did not go to the stake kicking and screaming. They did not go to be punished, to be killed, to be murdered, to be slaughtered, fighting back. They laid down their life. But whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need 
and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whosoever we ask and we receive of him because he, <clears throat> because we keep his commandments and do these things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he, as he gave us the commandment. And he that keepeth this commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. <clears throat> John is going to continue and the idea of not hating your brother, he's going to continue, but he's going to escalate. See, as Christians, it should be relatively easy for us to not hate somebody. And that's what John has been talking about. That's the example that John gave us about between Cain and Abel, the envy that took place that caused him to have hate in his heart that he was willing to murder his own brother. It should be easy for us to not hate each other, but John's going to escalate that. Of course, some people do make it harder than others, but not hating should be pretty easy. John's going to escalate. He's not, going to, he's not going to say not only don't hate, but he's going to say to love. And John is going to tell us how to love. He says, but whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. <clears throat> John says this to the people he's referencing. Again, he calls them as little children, um, trying to help them understand that selfishness is the world's way and not God's way. And as I thought about it, John has said little children a whole bunch of times. And one of the things that I ponder on from time to time is this. You know, we think um, about where we are now, right? Our level of spiritual maturity now. And we think about, you know, how we've gotten to this level of spiritual maturity now. And all of us come from different homes. Some come from broken homes. Some come from fantastic homes. Some come from homes that fall in the middle. We all come from different homes. But imagine what it would have been like if you would have been taught these things at a young age. And oftentimes, I think the reason that we're not taught these things at a young age is because we don't care. We don't get it. We don't understand. There's so many things that if I could go back as a teenager and learn as a teenager, I would redo I would go, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice that. I'm going to learn that. I'm going to do that different. So many times where somebody offered me wisdom, but I was too young and arrogant to hear that wisdom. But imagine what it would have been like if you were taught these things at a young age, if your parents taught you to give at three, if your parents taught your stewardship at 10. I think oftentimes, hear me closely, I think oftentimes we actually teach the love out of kids. I think we actually teach the love out of kids and we teach them to be selfish. I don't know about your kids, but I know about mine. <clears throat> and I know from time to time I'll come home from the shop and uh, my wife will have had somebody over that day and their kids will have been playing with my kids and my kid will come up to me proud of himself because he gave his favorite toy away. And obviously I'm not proud of him he gave his, because he gave his favorite toy away because that cost me money. And I'm going to have to buy another favorite toy. But my son doesn't think that he's going to get another favorite toy. That wasn't on his mind. All he knows is that this is his favorite toy. This is his best toy. He loves this toy, and he loves this person, and he wants to give that love to them. But as parents, again, we teach that out of them. Son, don't give your toys away. Daddy paid a lot of money for that for you. And we teach the love out of our children. We teach our kids to be selfish. We teach our kids that they're more important than other kids because to us, they are more important to other kids. I am investing my life in my children. But here's the thing. When they think they're more important than other kids, that's when we have a problem. That's when they become selfish. And then they go to Sunday school and they're confronted with the brutal reality and they're treated equally with everybody else. And wait a minute, that's not how I'm treated at home. Mommy and daddy think I'm the best. Now I'm not the best. Maybe this morning you look back and you see the same thing in yourself. Maybe you look back at a time when you enjoyed being able to give. Maybe this morning you're saying, I'm broke, I don't have anything to give. You say, why is he talking about giving? Isn't that what Pastor Davis is talking about? Well, God must have wanted you to hear it twice because he put it on Pastor Davis's heart to talk about stewardship. And here he put these verses in John. So he must have wanted us to hear about this and consider this twice. Um, John says, whosoever hath this world's goods and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up the bowels of his compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? 
It says, whosoever hath this world's goods, do you have stuff? Do you have stuff? You have stuff. I have stuff. I have so much stuff that probably about two years ago, I had somebody bring a truck and trailer over, and I got rid of an entire truck and trailer load of stuff that I did not need, that I had collected because I thought, oh, I can use that piece of steel for something. Oh, I can use that piece of wood for something. And I never got to use that piece of steel. I never got to use that piece of wood. So I had mounds of steel and wood and old tires that I thought, oh, tires are so expensive. I'm going to save this tire for when I need it. And then when I needed it, like, I didn't think about it. So it just sat there being an old tire. And then by the time I remembered it and needed it, it was a worthless tire. I had mounds of stuff and I had somebody just take that stuff away. Now that stuff was undesirable, but I'd like to think that I still have some stuff that is desirable. The word there for stuff, the word there for good that has good is the word bios from which we get the word biography. And what John is trying to communicate to us is that if you have the goods that are required for a living, okay, if you have a livelihood and you see someone in the church that has a need, please note, you see. It does not say that the pastor gets up and informs you that there's a need. It does not say that somebody comes over and tells you that there's a need. It doesn't say somebody sends you a text and says, I have a need. It says that you see that there's a need. It's something right there. You know, in order for us to see the needs of each other, we've got to get our eyes off ourselves, And that's one of the things that the devil loves to do is he loves to hit us hard um, and make us have to ha pay a bill that we weren't expecting. He loves to hit us hard and make us focus on our own problems. And I think that's one of his chief reasons for giving us problems is to discourage us, but then to make us look at ourselves because when we're looking at ourselves, we can't do what this says here. When I'm looking at myself, I can't see if somebody has a need because I'm so focused on myself. It's not only a passive thing. You're not only to not be focused on yourself <clears throat> because if you're focused on yourself, you can't see others, but you're supposed to be looking for someone who has a need, actively searching for someone who has a need. When is the last time you were looking for somebody to help in a physical way? The thought is, don't raise your hand. The thought is even more than that, okay? When was the, the last time that you looked at someone to be a blessing to you in a physical way, in a real way? And that's what John is talking about here. That's why he says, in truth, and not just in tongue, to be an actual real blessing. And we talked about this in James when James says, yeah, somebody shows up at your door, here you don't even have to search for him. James is nicer to you. James is easier on you. He says, somebody shows up at your door and says, I'm naked and hungry. And you say, go away, be warm and be filled. I prayed for you. James says, that's not faith. That's not real. That's what John is talking about here too. He's ta not talking about saying, go away, be warm and filled. He's talking about actually doing something. When's the last time you look for someone to be a blessing to in a physical way, in a real way, that could do nothing in return for you. Let's make that a little bit more real. When's the last time you looked for someone to be a blessing to that could not do anything for you and you did not tell a soul about it? See, oftentimes when someone does something for someone, they, they brag about it. And we've talked about this in Matthew 6, 3 through 5. It says, but when I do, thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and that thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. If you give something to someone, you should do it in such a way that you don't get credit for it, that you don't want credit for it. Then you'll get your reward in heaven. But if you do it here, if you do it so that people see you, if you do it in a loud way intentionally, and that's what it's talking about there, doing something so that everybody in the world knows about it, then you will get your credit here and your credit will be the praise of men. And can I just say, if you're on the receiving end, be grateful be grateful, be grateful, thank that person. And you know, sometimes people will even tell you, look, I wanna take care of you, I wanna do this for you, please don't tell anybody about it. Please don't tell anybody about it. Respect that if they say that, please respect that and be a gracious receiver, be thankful for receiving because you know what? Sometimes God knows that we need to give you something, you're like, I don't know why I need this, but next week you might find out why you needed it. You might find out what God knew that you didn't know. So we're to consider that brother who is needy. And it's also important to note that this brother who is needy, okay, you see that they're needy. They aren't telling you that they're needy. They didn't walk into church in sackcloth and ashes, wailing at the top of their lungs, woe is me, I have a need. They went about their life just as they would any other time, and you saw their need, and you met their need. In 1 John uh, 3, verse 22, it says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. 
Who are we supposed to ask? Does it say that we're supposed to ask the pastor? Does it say that we're supposed to ask the deacons? Does it say that you're supposed to ask your mama and your daddy? This is if you're the person who is in need, okay? If you're the person who is in need, not the person who wants to do something nice for somebody. It says, if you're the person in need, that you should do some asking. It says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. So if we're receiving of him, we have to assume that we asked him for it, right? That's fair. If you have a good relationship, your pastor will know what's going on. If you have a physical need in your life, your deacons will know what's going on. If you have a physical need in your life, your church members will know what's going on. But sometimes people have a need that they want the church to help them with, but they haven't asked God about it. They just expect the church uh, to know. But unfortunately, sometimes people are very private about their life, and that's okay. It's okay to be very private about your life. But if you're private about your life and nobody knows that you have a need, then you can't expect people to be able to help you. When praise time comes, they don't say a word. When testimony time comes, they don't say a word. When prayer time comes, they don't see a word. And then they wonder why nobody helped them because nobody knows what's going on in their life. There's a problem with all of this in our churches today. People are afraid to let anyone know what's going on in their life because they're afraid of being judged. They're afraid of people talking behind their back. They're afraid of people treating them differently. Remember what we talked about when we talked about with love and we talked about it again this morning, that love covers a multitude of sins. You know, we all know parents who love their kids, right? They love their kids, and their kids are 40 and living in the basement. And you say to those parents, parents, maybe, maybe you need to help, you know, Marvin. I use the name Marvin a lot because nobody here is named Marvin, and I'm safe. Unless one of you has a child named Marvin living in your basement, in which case, that's going to be awkward. Um, <laughs> say, you know, Marvin really needs to get out on his own. Maybe, Mom and Dad, it's time to let Marvin sink or swim. It's time to let Marvin figure it out. But the parents wouldn't hear that because the parents love him. And that love is allowing them to be blind to that sin in their kid's life. Can I suppose to you um, that if we love God's people that way, that someone in our family here, someone in our church here could make a bonehead decision, make a bonehead decision again, and make a bonehead decision again, instead of us going behind their back and going, hey, you realize that Aloysius made a boneheaded decision? made a boneheaded decision again, what we do is we love that person, we help that person, and maybe we've got a good enough relationship. Let's close there. Gracious Heavenly Father God, Lord, we love you. Father God, we thank you for what you've designed for your church. We thank you for how you've instructed us to love each other, for the example of love that you were when you laid your life down on the cross for us, for those of us who were still in sin, for those of us who blasphemed you. Father God, you laid your life down for us. Lord, will you help us to have that love for each other? Father, not just to not hate each other, but to love each other, to genuinely care about each other, to seek to meet each other's needs. In your name we pray, amen.